The most commonly used procedures for designing infinite impulse response, or IIR filters, are based on well-known theory for the design of analog or continuous time filters. So we're going to take a prototype analog filter and then convert it into a discrete time filter that satisfies the specifications of our design problem. Now there's four different types of continuous time filters that are commonly used in these design procedures. So when I describe the characteristics of these filters, we're going to talk about them in the context of a low-pass filter. So the Butterworth low-pass filter is monotonic in both the pass band and the stop band. That means that the gain steadily decreases from unity at DC or zero frequency and then continues decreasing into the stop band. And the farther you get away from DC, the lower the frequency response becomes. Now there's two types of Chebyshev filters. The Chebyshev type 1 filter has a pass band with ripples in it. That is, the response is equal ripple in the pass band, while its stop band has monotonically decreasing. So again, remember we're talking about a low pass filter. So we've got a ripple in the pass band and then in the stop band, the response just continues to decrease monotonically. Now the Chebyshev type 2 also has ripples, but in this case, the ripples are in the stop band. So the pass band has a monotonic response. Then the fourth category of filter, the elliptic filter, has ripples in both the pass and the stop bands of the filter. Now the advantage of allowing ripple is that in general it allows one to get a narrower transition band for a given order filter. So the elliptic filter is generally going to have the narrowest transition band for a given order and the Butterworth filter is going to have the widest transition band for a given order. If one can tolerate ripple, it allows you to satisfy specifications with a lower order filter. We talk about continuous time filters. We're going to have a frequency response, h of omega, which is defined in terms of the Fourier transform. And then the transfer function, which plays the analog of the system function that we've talked about for discrete time systems, is going to be defined in terms of a Laplace transform, h of s. The system function in a discrete time system was defined using the Z transform. Here, in continuous time filters, the Laplace transform plays the same role as the Z transform. So the Laplace transform of the impulse response, H of T, is H of S, the transfer function. And that can be defined as the integral from minus infinity to infinity of H of T times E to the minus ST dt, where the variable S is complex. It has a real part defined by sigma, and then the imaginary part is j omega. And just like with the z transform, which was defined in terms of a complex variable z, we can look at the Laplace transform in terms of the s plane. Well, since s is defined naturally in terms of a real and imaginary component, the real part sigma is the coordinate of the real along the real axis and then j omega it describes the imaginary axis or the vertical axis. Now if you look at the Laplace transform you can see that if I replace s by j omega then I'm going to get the Fourier transform. In other words I'll get the frequency response by evaluating s when sigma is equal to zero. So if I take h of s, the Laplace transform, and evaluate it on the j omega axis, in other words, when sigma is equal to zero, then I'm going to get the frequency response. And this is analogous to what we have in the z-plane, where if I evaluate the z-transform on the unit circle, then I get the frequency response. So here in the Laplace domain, the j omega axis has the same role as the unit circle does in the z-transform. Now we've seen in the discrete time case that systems described by linear constant coefficient difference equations lead to system functions that are a ratio of polynomials in z-inverse. 
Well, in the continuous time case, systems described by linear constant coefficient differential equations lead to transfer functions, h of s, that are ratios of polynomials in s. And we'll write that as a sum from k equals 0 to m of coefficients bk times s raised to the kth power. And then in the denominator, we'll have a sum from k equals 0 to n of ak s raised to the kth power. So n is the number of derivatives in the output of the system, whereas m is the number of derivatives that are present in the input of the system. So since these are ratios of polynomials, I have the same notions of poles and zeros with the Laplace transform as we did with the z-transform. So I'm going to factor this equation in terms of a product of roots of the numerator and of the denominator. The ck's are the zeros and the dk's, those are going to be the poles of this system. We can take the inverse Laplace transform of this transfer function to find the impulse response and it turns out that this proceeds in a manner similar to the, what we've done with the z-transform in that we're going to use a partial fraction expansion to write this as sum of terms involving each pole in the denominator of those terms. When we take the inverse Laplace transform each of these poles generates an e to the dk times t u of t response. And I've written the inverse Laplace transform here, assuming that none of the poles are repeated. So this is very insightful because it says that continuous time systems are described in terms of exponential signals, e to the dk t u of t. And we've also assumed here that we're looking for a causal continuous time system. So putting this all together, we readily conclude that if a system is going to be both stable and causal, then these exponential terms need to decay. Because for a system to be stable in continuous time, the impulse response has to be absolutely integrable. So for these to decay, they have to be decaying exponentials, which means the real part of these poles, dk, have to be less than zero. So I have e to the negative sigma k t involved in the impulse response. Well, if the real part of the poles are less than zero, that implies that the poles have to be in the left half of the s-plane. Any poles in the right half of the s-plane cannot be associated with a stable causal system. So just like we had in discrete time that the poles had to be inside the unit circle for the system to be both stable and causal, in continuous time the poles have to be in the left half of the s-plane for the system to be stable and causal. So the way our design procedure works is we're going to start off with a prototype continuous time low-pass filter HLP of S. So this is defined in terms of its transfer function involving the variable S, which was sigma plus j omega. So the prototype low-pass filter is going to be, depend on whether we choose Butterworth, Chebyshev 1, Chebyshev type 2, or elliptical. That will give us different prototype low-pass filters. And typically these are chosen so that the half power point, or the point where the magnitude response is a square root of 2 over 2 is at omega equals 1 radian per second. So then in the next stage we're going to take our critical frequencies for the discrete time filter that is pass band edges and stop band edges. We're going to take those and we're going to convert those to critical frequencies for a continuous time filter. And this is a stage known as pre-warping because there's a nonlinear relationship here between locations of critical frequencies in discrete time and their corresponding locations in continuous time. That's because of the way we're ultimately going to convert our continuous time filter to a discrete time filter, which will be step four of this procedure. So once I have these critical frequencies, then I'm going to use something called a frequency transformation, which is replacing the variable s 
by some function of another variable, s tilde. And the goal of this frequency transformation is to take our prototype filter and give us a continuous time filter that has these omega k's as its critical frequencies. So the transformation is actually fairly straightforward and we'll talk about frequency transformations in another lecture. The idea is that I take my low pass prototype filter and everywhere that I have s in the transfer function, I replace that with a function f of s tilde. And that gives me a new transfer function h of s tilde or correspondingly a new frequency response h of omega tilde which is dependent on the prototype filter frequency response with omega replaced by f of omega tilde. So at this point if we've done everything properly the critical frequencies of this transformed analog filter are in the right locations. And next we're going to convert from continuous time to discrete time. Most commonly this is done using the bilinear transform. And the bilinear transform is a relationship between the Laplace variable s and the z transform variable z. If we define s tilde to be equal to 2 times 1 minus z inverse over 1 plus z inverse, that this transformation has some very desirable properties, which we'll look at in detail in another lecture. So I obtain, finally, my discrete time filter h of z by taking my frequency transformed analog filter h of s tilde and everywhere I see s tilde I substitute 2 times 1 minus z inverse divided by 1 plus z inverse. So if h of s tilde is a ratio of polynomials in s tilde this transformation will result in an h of z that's a ratio of polynomials in z inverse, which is exactly the kind of filter that we can implement with the linear constant coefficient difference equation. And then our final step in this process is to verify that our discrete time filter h of z satisfies the specifications that we desired to meet originally. Because one can make errors along the way here, or in certain cases if the design is specified too tightly it turns out that numerical issues can cause you to end up with an h of z that don't match the original specifications. So this is an overview of how filter design takes place. And if you use MATLAB, this is the procedure that's employed by MATLAB's filter design functions like Butter and Cheb1 and so on. They follow this process to design the filter. To do this, though, if you're going to use a software package, you don't need to understand the details of these steps. You can apply it, and as long as you check the end result that you've got a filter which satisfies your specs, then you're good to go.